Welcome okay. to the Rocky Mountain Mathematical Physics Seminar. It's my pleasure to announce Eugene Rabinovich from the University of California, Berkeley. And he will speak today about factorization algebras for bulk boundary systems. Please. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Marcus. And thank you also for the invitation. Um, so it's, I'm excited to talk and uh, and uh, I think I want to try to make it so that I want everyone to feel comfortable interrupting as with questions whenever they like. Um, I don't have my agenda is not to get to the last slide. My agenda is to like get to a point, you know, have people understand at least something. So <clears throat> anyway, so like I said, feel free to stop me whenever. Um, and yes, I'm going to talk about factorization algebras for bulk, bulk boundary systems. Sorry, it's a siren. Um, anyway, so let me talk at the, oh, Daniel, did you have a question? Okay. Um, let me sort of start by introducing a very big picture, what is going on. Um, so Costello and Gwilliam, they've, uh, they have these two volumes of books where they construct factorization algebras for perturbative field theories on manifolds with boundary. Um, and I want to make some notes here. So if you don't know what a factorization algebra is, that's okay. Uh, um, we'll define that we'll, we'll discuss, we'll describe these later. For now, you can think of think of the associative algebras or EN algebras or vertex algebras. They're all sort of factorization algebras are supposed in some sense an umbrella that includes all of them. Um, and right, so the important thing about the Costello Gwilliam work is that they discuss manifolds without boundary. And um, as mathematical physicists, we all know that uh, there's a lot of interesting phenomena that occur once you consider a system with a boundary. Um, so that's sort of the what's this talk is about. Um, so there's two papers here where we extend the constructions um, of Costello and William to certain classes of uh, field theories on manifolds with boundary. So this one is, this one's the one that's joined with um, William and Williams. And this has to do with free quantum QF, you know, quantum bulk boundary systems. Um, this is a solo paper and it ha it's just has to do with classical, uh, let me do it in other order interacting classical. And then my thesis is interacting quantum. And um, one of the nice things uh, about these papers is that we can study at least certain types of bulk boundary correspondences, one of which is the churn simons WZW correspondence for abelian Lie algebras. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, yes of course. So for per perturbative field theory, uh, yes. uh, 
So is topological field theory a perturbative in your definition? So um, I would say there one is neither is a subset of the other. I would say like there are perturbative and non-perturbative aspects of topological field theories. Like a Chen Simon's uh, theory with only the topological term, in your definition, is it perturbative or not? Well, you can, it's non-perturbative in general, but you can study its perturbative expansion around any classical solution. I see. So I would so yeah, you can study in a topological theory perturbatively or non-perturbatively. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to say one last thing here is that we'll focus, so we'll focus mostly on examples today, mostly on the examples, the free examples, so they're much easier to get a grasp on. Um, so, right. And the main example is going to be Chern Simon's WZW correspondence. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about now the Chern Simon's WZW correspondence. Again, in broad brush strokes, and then we'll make this uh, precise later. Um, so, you can think of the chiral West Zumino Witten model. Um, it's a theory, it's defined on a, any Riemann surface sigma. And the way I like to think about it is that it can be described in the BV formalism, but in terms of shifted Poisson geometry. And um, now, so for those of you unfamiliar with the BV formalism, let me just make sure I have the right note here. So, so as a reminder, the BV formalism is sort of a way of encoding field theory um, in, in the theory of minus one shifted symplectic geometry. Um, and so, you know, if you weaken this adjective symplectic to Poisson geometry, so minus one shifted Poisson geometry, then, you know, you can classically, you can describe what is meant by such objects and chiral WZW falls in this class. And um, this is a class of non-Lagrangian field theories. They're non-Lagrangian as a note. And um, so what you can do, there's uh, because of, because it's a, per, you know, in this particular example, there's an ansatz for the quantization of this um, chiral WZW system. And that ansatz is a factorization algebra known as, you might call the Belian Katz Moody factorization algebra or the Heisenberg factorization algebra. Um, it's related to the Heisenberg vertex algebra. And I'll note that this is sort of, um, this is an, on, like I wanna note that this is an ansatz when there's no general theory for quantization of Poisson BV theories, as far as I understand it. 
and that's sort of you can view my dissertation work as providing this general theory of quantization of Poisson BV theories. Um, and I'll explain how in a moment. Um, there's a dual perspective, a, a sort of one dimension up perspective. You can think of chiral WZW as the boundary condition for Chern Simons theory in one extra dimension. And um, it's shifted Poisson structure, it inherits from the fact that it's a boundary condition for this theory. And um, what we show is that um, in our paper with Brian and Owen, that a quantization of this, of the coupled system in three dimensions, Chern Simons, um, Chern Simons in three dimensions with this particular boundary condition gives us in a certain specific way, which I will mention in a moment, gives us, returns this quantization on sats of chiral WZW in, on the boundary. So we have a bulk boundary system upstairs and uh, it induces a quantization of the sort of degenerate field theory on the boundary. And so let me just quickly draw a picture. So I, I have a question yeah. maybe yeah. first. Yes. So I'm curious about what you mean when you say that it's a non-Lagrangian theory, because at least, uh, you know, so, I mean, my perspective is coming from physics, but sure. I think that what you're describing is a boundary theory of what I would call an abelian turn simons theory, yes. um, most likely. So, I mean, there are Lagrangians that people write down for that in physics. Maybe they don't satisfy some some property uh, that a Lagrangian um, field theory is supposed to satisfy. That's a good question. You mean like the there there is some action for W West Zumino Witten theory? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and including cut. You know, it would. It would look like an action for, you know, it would be an action with a single, if it's the theory that I'm thinking of, I'm not totally mm -hmm. sure, but yeah. it would have a single real scalar field. And yeah. um, the important term, the most important term in the Lagrangian, which would is the one that would also be quantized coming from yeah. the level in the Chern Simons theory, right. would be something like a single time derivative of the field times the spatial derivative of the field, um, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Uh, yeah, it's it's roughly of that, it's roughly of that structure. I might be remembering. So I think that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I might be remembering something not one hundred percent right, but um, yeah. So one, I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I I I know that sometimes when high energy physicists say Lagrangian versus non Lagrangian field theory, they they insist that the a Lagrangian field theory has to have a renormalizable Lagrangian, and mm -hmm. so. I'm not since yeah. this theory theory is free. I would never. I wouldn't normally worry about whether it's normalizable yes. or not. But yeah, I don't think that's the issue here. I mean, I we're not usually worried about like renormalizability so much. I mean, we you know there's a framework for that in our in this in these methods, but it's not you know it's possible to quantize something without it being renormalizable in these in these using these techniques. Um, the particular object I'm thinking of, so I, this name might be a little bit misleading. I, Brian and I, Brian spent some time trying to explain to me the terminology in physics and I still don't fully understand it. But um, I think what I want to think of, the, what I'm describing here is not necessarily, um, is I think, I think this terminology physicists agree with that there is a chiral WZW boundary condition in Chern Simons theory. And this, the sort of structure that boundary conditions inherit in our lang in this language, in the BV formalism um, leads to these objects, which are 
um, described and shifted Poisson geometry. And from such an object, I can't really write down an action functional for you. Um, mm, okay, yeah. In the usual way that if I, like in the language of shifted symplectic geometry, I can write down an action functional for you, uh, but not in the language of shifted Poisson geometry. Like okay. if I have, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, okay, that's fine. So this terminology might be a bit misleading. I might, yeah. And I apologize for that. It was, I used no, to- No no, need to apologize. You know, there are many different communities even within physics who, you yeah. know, deal with these kind of field theories and there's no uniform terminology, so. <laughs> Fair. Well, in any case, um, yeah, so what I have in mind is this object is a boundary. I, I th I'm thinking of this object as the structure, as, as being described as a boundary condition for Trim Simon's theory. And in that language, I can't describe it as a Lagrangian theory. Okay, um, let me give a picture. Maybe it'll be easier to remember by. So um, let's say we have some Riemann surf. Some Riemann surface sigma here. A lot of sirens today. So we can put um, Chern Simons WZW on this this coupled bulk boundary system on this manifold with boundary. And, or we can, we can study just some different system here, which might be called, you know, Katz Moody or WZW, chiral. And um, somehow when you push forward this whole system down to here, they coincide. Of course, there's extra structure obtained from the extra direction up here that's forgotten when you push forward. But in terms of the structure that you see sort of along this, along this manifold, you see the same object upstairs and downstairs. And again, I'll be, I'll get even, I'll get more precise about this later, hopefully. Um, all right, so that was just a not so brief introduction. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, here's the outline. In the next few sections, we'll, we'll think about some background. And then we'll, in this section three, we're gonna state the main theorems. And then if time permits, we might do another example. Oh. Should not have clicked it. Another example. Okay, maybe now is a good place to pause for any other questions. All right, so let me talk about factorization algebra. I by no means expect the audience to be familiar with these objects. Um, so, very loosely speaking, we think of a factorization algebra as an, as an object which mixes algebra and geometry. So for example, um, vertex algebras are like that. Um, they sort of mix complex and uh, complex geometry with algebra. EN algebras are like that. Um, they mix topology and algebra. So in general, I would say that 
you should think of a factorization algebra in that, in that vein. So the data encoded in a factorization algebra will be given by a cochain complex, f of u for every subset. So on a topolo it's an object which lives on a topological space and it assigns a cochain complex to every open subset of M in a Cauchy-like manner. But there's also um, multiplication maps. So whenever you have some number N of pairwise disjoint opens that all live inside some larger open, we're going to have for you a map at like such, as such. It's a, it's a map which takes the tensor product of these n cochain complexes and maps into the larger complex. So note, um, in particular, a factorization algebra is a pre sheaf on M. And that comes from viewing, um, taking n equals one here. So whenever we have one open subset, including into a larger open subset, we get the structure maps for pre sheaf And I want to say also that, so these are the data. These are the data for a factorization algebra. And um, I'd like to also mention some, uh, some, there's some, uh, what's it called? That, uh, can requirements or conditions. We put some conditions on the data. So there's two main ones. The first one is a natural associativity con condition. It'll be sort of clearer in pictures once I do the picture. And then there's a certain local to global principle. It's not exactly the local to global principle for co-sheaves, but it's similar. And uh, like I said before, factorization algebras that are satisfy certain extra conditions, they reproduce familiar, familiar objects like EN algebras or vertex algebras. And let me just draw a picture real quick. So suppose you have some open subset U, factorization algebra is going to assign to that some Cochain complex. And suppose we have an inclusion of opens. Say this is U one, U two u3, what we're going to get out of that is a map from f of u1 tensor f of u2 tensor f of u3, a map from there to f of v. And now maybe it's sort of clear what the associativity condition might look like. So suppose I factored through first this map by, um, I can sort of, I'll have a map, um, it's called this W. Uh, this map will factor through
if we just simply take the structure maps for the inclusion of these two into this one, we have a map like so, and then we have a further structure map um, into here. And the associativity condition demands that this commutes. So these are the sorts of uh, objects factorization algebras are. They're sort of, um, they're, as you could see, there's like a, each, each open is assigned its own sort of algebra, underlying algebra object type. Each open is assigned its own cochain complex. And for every possible arrangement of these opens into larger opens, we get structure maps. And so there's a lot of information in this, but sometimes you can distill it down quite simply. So another example, a very simple example that I, that sort of captures the flavor is um, a fo the following factorization algebra on R. So So if we have an associative algebra on, if we just have an associative algebra with multiplication mu, we can assign to it a, factoriz a factorization algebra on R. And so pictorially, this is R, it will assign to a single open interval, it will assign A. And if we have more intervals, it will assign A tensor A. Or if we have three intervals, it will assign A tensor A tensor A. And now, suppose we include, say, so we have, suppose we have this following inclusion. We have an A on the big space, but we have two smaller A's here. And we need to, the structure map for the inclusion of these two intervals into the bigger interval should be a map this way. And that'll be mu, the multiplication. And uh, you can check that this associativity condition back here, it is satisfied thanks to the associativity of A. This is the most basic example of a vertex algebra, oh, sorry, factorization algebra. And um, I want to say that Sometimes, I think sometimes some perspectives on quantum field theory in higher dimensions, they will sort of focus, try to construct a fact, uh, an algebra of observables. And um, from this perspective, um, the algebra part is sort of a, an avatar of the fact that um, we're, we live on the real line and that there are only so many different configurations of open intervals into each other, at least up to homotopy. And um, in general, I think uh, we should want a factorization algebra, but uh, that's me proselytizing a bit. But um, as a, a simple example, we can think of a vertex algebra, which is supposed to describe the observables of a conformal field theory in two dimensions and um, doesn't have just a single multiplication but a multiplication parameterized by um, a holomorphic coordinate. Um, yeah. Okay, that's the 
that's the end of the discussion of factorization algebras. Um, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so it, it maybe, uh, so is, is the factorization algebra supposed to kind of encode like locality of the, of the QFT? Yes, good question. Thank you for asking. Um, that goes back to this principle here. I think the locality of the QFT gets, has its manifestation in the local to global principle of the um, factorization algebras. So that's where that gets included, that gets manifested. Can you say something more about the local, this local to global principle? Yes, I can say a bit more. Um, so like I said, this uh, factorization algebra is in particular a pre-cosheaf on M. This local to global principle is a sheaf. It's, it's basically a requirement sort of requires that this pre-cosheaf be a homotopy cosheaf but only for particular types of covers um, known as Weiss or Weiss. I don't know if it's Weiss or Weiss covers. Um, and that those are essentially covers which um, which, how do I put it? Open covers of a set for which any finite collection, any finite subset of that set are contained in one of the elements of the open cover. So it's related to, yeah, I mean, I don't know how to, I think it's a little bit subtle, so I won't get too much further into the details there. Any other questions? Yeah, can I ask something else? So yeah. uh, sort of the only kind of uh, mathematical formalism related to, to QFT that I'm sort of a little bit familiar with is like the yeah. TQFT axioms. Yes. Um, so, so do these, and I, I feel like I've seen the name factorization algebras pop mm -hmm. up when people talk about mm -hmm. TQFTs. Um, yes. Can you say something about like the relation or where, where yeah. these? Uh, wait, no. I'll just add a page. Um, right. So let me make sure I get this right. So basically, There's a thesis of Claudia Scheinbauer which says that um, basically for each locally constant factorization algebra on Rn, she gets a um, fully extended, what you might call twisted TFT. in um, n dimensions. So the basically the Cauchy condition will allow you to recover. So a factorization algebra on Rn doesn't really tell you what to do for a general n dimensional manifold, but the um, descent condition will essentially force a certain value that gets assigned to every um, manifold. 
every n-dimensional cobordism. And that's the rough idea of how you can uh, recover such a, you know, cobordism functor, a functor for out of a cobordism category. Um, and Claudia also shows that this is an equivalence of infinity one categories or infinity n categories. I'm not super, I'm not the biggest expert on uh, that perspective, but um, anyway, that's the relationship here. And as uh, unpublished work of my advisor, and Bill Dwyer and Stefan Stolz uh, essentially constructs a similar type of functor um, for a general, so um, how do I best describe this? A factorization, factorization algebra is on a let me I'm going to be very um, crude. I'm not going to really I'm going to brush some of the details under the rug because it's a uh, subject for another talk. But um, so geometric Factorization algebras give rise to twisted functorial field theories. So these, so similar to the perspective of quantum uh, TQFT, where you have a functor out of a cobordism category, you might allow your objects and your morphisms to have some other geometric structure. And that, that can be reflected on the side of the factorization algebras. And the output is also reflected in, uh, in the output, it's also reflected in the um, cobordism category. So there's, um, anyway, those are the connections to the functorial field theory approach. I see, thanks. That's, that's... Mm -hmm. Okay. How did I get back here? All right, so let me get to turn Simon's theory. So if M is an oriented three manifold and has no boundary, geez, sorry. Don't usually have problems with my iPad, but. So we can consider the following free theory. It's perturbative and it's perturbed around the trivial classical solution. It can be described by the space of fields EQ, where E is the shifted Durham complex of the manifold. And there's this, like I said, uh, BV formalism is about minus one sh shifted symplectic geometry. There is this pairing, which is the wedge and integrate pairing. Um, and um, when M has no boundary, we have this nice uh, Stokes formula or integration by parts formula. And um, let me rephrase things a bit more geometrically to explain, like, explain the meaning of this formula in terms of shifted symplectic geometry. So you can think of Q, that's a square zero vector field on E. And this pairing is a constant symplectic form on E. 
And this equation tells us that the lead derivative along Q of the pairing is zero. So this is sort of familiar, would be familiar to anybody that knows the BV formalism. Um, it's a, this compatibility condition is precisely this requirement that the lead derivative along Q of the vector of the symplectic form vanish. Um, like I said, this is a crucial equation that guarantees it that that a quantization that you can quantize. So now let me describe what happens when you quantize. So you can take the factor, uh, an object, you could take, sorry, the factorization algebra for this theory will assign to every subset of U, it will assign a particular cochain complex, sorry, subset of M. And it will assign this particular cochain complex. Um, I'll explain this, this, um, this operator is called the BV Laplacian. And it says essentially it, um, how do I describe it? On sim squared, it's just, it corresponds to the pairing. So pair out pairs of fields with this pairing. That's the meaning of this differential here. And um, because of this compat, like I said, because we're pairing out pairs of fields with this pairing, um, and because of this equation, this differential squares precisely to zero. And um, the structure maps are given by the following composites. The um, so for each open U, we have the inclusion. Ah, before I say that, I also want to explain uh, that we think of this as some sort of this is like polynomial functions. On E of U. So this is on the Duram complex shifted. And the reason we think of it this way is that there's a natural, um, quasi-isomorphism of these compactly supported functions, so compactly supported forms into the distributional forms or the distributional dual to the space of forms. And so this object here is like a polynomial algebra on the, um, space functions. Anyway, so the inclusions uh, of compactly supported forms along, sorry, the um, extension by zero maps from compactly supported forms on smaller opens into larger opens, they furnish they furnish this map. And this map here is multiplication in the symmetric algebra. Anyway, so that's the factorization products. Um, Yeah, and anyway, that's the factorization product. So this is a, it's a factorization algebra in three dimensions. And um, anyway, there's also, 
a factorization algebra in two dimensions. Oh, there. Like I said before, this equation was very important in quantization. If M has a boundary, we no longer have this equation hold. And um, right. So instead, we can ask for our fields to lie in some subspace of the boundary fields. For example, we might ask that when we restrict to the boundary, all the uh, forms have type one star. And then once we impose that, you can construct, uh, you can construct a factorization algebra essentially by the same means. And that's, um, that's this last statement here is theorem, you know, is essentially a, the um, a theorem in our paper that, um, the constructions of Costello and Guillaume um, remain unchanged when you when you replace a spa the normal space of fields with the boundary fields. Um, I sense that I'm co I'm coming up against my time limit, so uh, I'll I'll stop here and maybe have wait for questions to sort of guide me about what to cover next <laughs> or what to, you know, guide me about what to elaborate on. Um, I mean, you, you can use, because we started a bit later, so you still have a couple of more minutes. So if you. Okay. Yeah, I will, I'll do my best. I know that when somebody is given, including me is given five minutes to try to summarize the rest of their talk, it's incomprehensible. So I'll do my best to make it make sense. Um, so I'll skip through all of this. That's there's some derived geometric picture that's going on here, but it's not really necessary to understand. On this slide, I would have described in detail a factorization algebra that you can construct on a Riemann surface. So for example, uh, when I imposed the boundary condition on the previous slide we discussed, um, we chose a complex structure on the boundary, on the two-dimensional boundary. So you can construct, I won't get into the details, but you can construct a factorization algebra on the boundary. And then finally, I can actually state a theorem. So if you have a Riemann surface, such as the one we've discussed on this slide, and you consider chern simons theory on a three manifold of this form, and you impose the WZW boundary condition, um, there are two objects that you can consider on sigma itself. There was this Katz-Moody factorization algebra that I fit, you know, didn't describe but gestured at in the previous slide. And then there's this full chern simons WZW. Um, that's a factorization algebra on M but you can push forward factorization algebras just as you can push forward um, sheaves or pre-co-sheaves. It's, it's the exact same construction. And uh, once you push forward, you get something on the boundary and there's an equivalence of factorization algebras, which relates the Katz-Moody vertex algebra on the boundary to the full bulk boundary observables. And um, that this is, you could say a mnemonic. So the quantization of this coupled bulk boundary system 
it induces a quantization of uh, what you might call the WZW system on the boundary. And this theorem is sort of evidence or sort of, um, yeah, evidence for a proposal. So like I said, th there is some ansatz for the observables of this quantum Poisson BV theory. But in general, uh, there is no ansatz. So the philosophy that um, sort of I subscribe to, and it goes back to it goes back to it goes back to Kansevich, is to uh, form a, a theory in one dimension higher, for which the Poisson BV theory is a boundary condition, and quantize that theory in one dimension higher. And that's sort of why, you know, yeah, this is the relationship of bulk boundary systems to the quantization of Poisson type objects. Okay, I'll stop there and we can go. For, you know, we can yeah. Go so let's thank the speaker for the talk. Yeah, are there questions? So we still have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, yeah. Could you comment? Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Chweda. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so here, I, I think you, uh, you didn't uh, include the Fermi in the, in the uh, transaminal theory. Oh, I mean, in, in this case, we right, need to add pure uh, spin, spin structure. Right. Say that again? I'm sorry. Uh, I uh, so here we don't we we don't consider the spin structure of the manifold. That's correct. We uh, it's the pure just the pure gauge theory. Uh, I see. I see. So there's no no matter field at all. No matter fields in this in this example. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question is so uh, here you focus on the abelian abelian case, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So can you simply imagine what, what which part will be modified if you, if you uh, generalize to the not not really case? So that's something I hope to do in the next year or so using the techniques of my dissertation. Um, and Brian Williams has done some suggestive computations, but um, yeah. So you would get here. The expectation is you still get the Katz Moody factorization algebra up here uh, on the boundary, but there's this shift by the critical level, which some might find familiar. So there will be a shift. Um, so the Katz Moody's come with a certain level, right? So in general for non-abelian, you're gonna have, so if we count quantize here at, I mean, it's hard to describe because you'd have to fix some conventions, but uh -huh. essentially you can quantize Chern Simons theory at some level in the bulk, and you can map it to, uh, yeah. Chern Simons that's theory has this parameter uh -huh. of the level in the bulk, and the Katz Moody has a level on the boundary, and there's. Right. Yeah, I think in physics, for example, the SU2 level K. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a billion transcendent series. Uh, the property for the SU2 level K transcendent theory and the boundary CFT is well known. Right. Physics. Yeah. Right, right. So that's the expectation is that you can do that all fully mathematically with uh, these techniques. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the, the short answer is uh, the generalization is. Uh, uh, easy or <laughs> sorry, I didn't quite catch. catch I don't think it's easy. I mean, uh, the like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm working through in a just a simple one dimensional bulk boundary interacting example in my dissertation, and even that takes a fair bit of work. So, I don't, I hope that once I fully, once I understand the general, the 
mechanics of how to reproduce these computations, I will, it will be fast, but I can't say, I, I would, I wouldn't, I would hesitate <clears throat> to say that it's easy. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anya, you had a... Uh, it was Daniel. Yeah, da oh, Daniel. Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment more on the connection of the factorization algebra approach to the algebraic quantum field theory approach where you have a, like a net of C star algebras. I think you seem to not like that approach, but I didn't quite understand the reason why. Um, I did, yeah, I realized that there's, um, um, how do I put it? I, I bashed it probably unnecessarily. I, I just mean that I think it's nice if your if your observables for each open subset of your space time have an algebra structure, but an associative algebra structure. Um, but from this perspective, it's sort of something extra on top of what you might expect just from the sort of configurations of open some open subsets in other open subsets. Um, but I do think there is a relation. Uh, I don't know this very well, but um, Owen William and Kasia Reisner have sort of investigated some aspects of this. Um, so that it's, I think it's, they're expected to be complementary perspectives. I see. Um, but yeah. is the, the C star algebra, uh, the net of observables? Yeah. Is that, like a subset of this, the factorization algebra approach? Um, so I would say that, it's um, perhaps, I don't wanna say that, but it, uh, I think it is true if you have sort of the sort of object like a like uh, the net of observables that you might construct in the PA in the perturbative AQFT approach um, that you do get a factorization algebra out of that net. I think that's true. So in that sense, it's maybe a bit more general. Uh, the factorization algebras are include that case. Um, the techniques of Costello and William are more suited, are sort of geared, to, like the nitty gritty is geared towards Riemannian signature, whereas the C star algebra approach is more of a um, Lorentzian signature perspective. Thanks. Yeah. I have, um, uh, are there other questions? No? Okay, I have one more question too. Actually, it, about quantization. Um, right. I mean, you have here the name Koncevich, so it's mm -hmm. probably meant deformation quantization. Yes. Um, and uh, so, as far as I understand, deformation quantization of field theories is still, I don't want to call it in its infancy, but it's still. Mm -hmm. um, a difficult subject. Let's put it that way. There are there is work by several people uh, in this area, but it's by far not as worked out as the deformation quantization, let's say, of symplectic or Poisson manifolds. Right. Uh, but but right. May, maybe there's another kind of quantization you have in mind here. Um, you're saying the quantization theory of of Poisson BV theories, the deformation quant. You, or even of in the symplectic case? Um, well, I, I mean, the, if you have a symplectic manifold, then I mean, the, the deformation quantization, I mean, is well studied. Likewise, by Koncevich, if you have a Poisson manifold, you, 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 there are existence and classification results by Koncevich. But mm -hmm. here, um, you, you are in the infinite dimensional setting. I mean, this is a John Simons theory, West Semino Witten theories, right, the, right. Are infinite dimensional field theories. Yes. And there, um, 
it's maybe not as well understood as the finite dimensional manifold case yet. And I just would be interested, I mean, what kind of quantization you use here? Is it deformation quantization or something else? And um, yeah, so, on which is it based? Yeah, so, um, so it's all sort of extending, uh, it is a sort of deformation quantization um, that you can describe, you sort of have this factorization algebra classically. Mm -hmm. um, it's a class, it's, and uh, because it's the, you know, factorization of algebra of observables of a, like a shifted symplectic type object, mm -hmm. it's a factorization algebra of, you know, we might call shifted Poisson algebra, a factorization algebra with values in shifted Poisson algebras. And um, the like the result of Costello and William says that for if you have a quantization of that field theory in the sense of Costello and William, um, then you have um, basically a de deformation quantization of that mm -hmm. factorization algebra of quantum observables. Um, oh, okay. So, uh, you know, it's not, yeah, I, the, that, the, the, the factorization algebras are the objects that, that are getting deformation quantized. Um, and there's this methods of Costello and William uh, to show that somehow that the mm -hmm. like renormalization that you need to do to make sense of mm -hmm. of of these infinite dimension like of like Poisson structures on infinite dimensional spaces and so on that that's compatible with yeah there's that's they just have a general theory um, now I it may or may not do what you want it to do. That, that I don't know. Um, okay, thank you. I, I have one more question, actually. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so is there a, a general, more general story? I mean, uh, if the boundary is uh, a fusion category, the, the bulk is the, the dream field center of the fusion category. Is there also such a correspondence, bulk boundary cor correspondence? Um, I think that has to do with like the theory of like, of the line defects, uh -huh. um, line defects in the three-dimensional theory and point defects in the two-dimensional theory. So conjecturally, yes, you might be able to describe, um, yeah, the, conjecturally, I think you might be able to do something like that, but, uh, I don't really, I can't really tell you something concrete. It's very, it's very, it still requires a lot more machinery and work. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that, that that's a very, very big question. But uh, well, one difference here, your, your, your boundary is gapless, it's a CFT, it's gapless. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in the case I mentioned, the, the boundary is gapped. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a big difference. But uh, I, I think the, the, the bulk boundary correspondence are, are, are always there for the topological uh, uh, theory. Yeah. I th yeah, I mean, uh, I think that if you, yeah. I, I think that's probably well studied by um, maybe like, uh, like Fuchs, Runkel, Schweiger on the math side, but they have a different language. Um, Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it would be very far off to say it in, in this language here. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Yeah. Okay, and uh, next week uh, we will have another talk in the Rocky Mountain Math Physics Seminar and see you then. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye everybody.